you can't make a way. Hey, hey, so humble yourself and pray and guard his Torah. Obey each day. And Moshe said, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart, and you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom to everyone worshiping with us at home. It's a blessing to be here on Yahweh's Set Apart Day. Amen. Amen. The name of the message today is called Know Yahweh, and and it's K-N-O-W. I know I play with words a lot of times, but there's no no trick in this one today. It's Know Yahweh. And I'm I'm gonna do something a little a little different. I'd like to share with you some details uh, of a few of the winners of the Darwin Award today. All right. Uh, is everyone familiar with the Darwin Awards? Oh, well, if you're not familiar with them, the, the folks at the Darwin Awards, they, they give this award to people who do, well, let's say not so smart things, uh, which end up resulting in them participating in what is called the natural selection process. Okay. That's why the, the name of the Darwin Awards. And they wind up losing their lives as a result of not doing a smart thing. And, and uh, some, of them, some of them get uh, honorable mention, but they're usually still around. <laughs> okay? But they did something not smart. Now, I did not write these articles. All right? So, so don't infer that any insensitivity was written by me. Okay? All right, but anyway, so our first one that we're going to look at today was, uh, this was from September 2013 in Finland. There were two brothers-in-laws uh, who were united by a common interest uh, that is shared by a small but regrettably significant uh, uh, proportion of the population uh, collecting war weapons. By the date of their deaths, they had collected over 100 frag grenades, bazookas, fuse materials, and ammunition from the forests of Lapland. The men enjoyed collecting the weapons as trophies, yet had no training in the handling and the disposal of explosives. One can see how this is going to end. All right. Around 6 p.m. on Friday night, the 24- and 27-year-old men were both in the garage with their antique weapons collection. The older man... I think it's kind of interesting that they're referring to a 27-year-old as an older man. Uh, the older man had finished defusing a grenade and was carefully removing the payload. The object, uh, the object of his attention was not a small hand grenade, but rather a large 75-millimeter anti-tank grenade, 42 centimeters, 17 inches long. Ironically, the attempt to render it harmless resulted in the opposite outcome. Uh, in the northern town of Kemi, the, uh, uh, the, piece, the piece of the garage was shattered. I'm, yeah, the piece of the garage was shattered by a small explosion. The man holding the grenade died in the ambulance and the other survived with serious injuries. In the aftermath of the explosion, 200 people within 150 meters surrounding the garage were evacuated to a school, and then dozens of kilograms of explosives were safely removed by the police department. Evacuees returned to their homes with gratitude for their lives if uh, more war weapons had been set off in a chain reaction, then there would have been victims and damaged buildings up to 300 meters away from the garage. Thankfully, it was not a full detonation. Rather than exploding, the old explosive material combusted and burned. Since no bystanders were injured, this was a wonderfully apt nomination for the Darwin Award Plus Honorable Mention. In Finland, 
you do not disassemble bomb, bomb disassembles you. <laughs> all right. Now, it looks like these fellows had been doing this for a while. All right. They, they certainly knew that they were dealing with something dangerous. All right. And likely he had learned a lot about weaponry of the era. All right. But, but there was at least one thing missing. They did not have the knowledge of how to handle this deadly situation appropriately, and it cost them death and injury. <clears throat> would you say this was not a smart thing to do? I would say so. All right, well, how about this one? <clears throat> February uh, 27th, 2012, North Carolina. It says, it was just a freak accident, said an investigator. <laughs> that caused the death of a 43-year-old Gary Allen Banning. Gary was at a friend's apartment when he spotted a salsa jar containing a mystery fluid. Thinking it was an alcoholic beverage, he helped himself to a sizable swig of gasoline. Naturally enough, he immediately spit out the offending liquid uh, onto uh, his clothes. Then, uh, to recover from the shock, Gary lit a cigarette. <laughs> Whoosh. Gas plus flame equals combustion. Firefighters responded to calls reporting a fire in the apartment and found a badly burned man sitting on a charred carpet. The following morning, Gasoline Gary died at the UNC Burn Center in Chapel Hill. Two mistakes caused his death. The first mistake was minor, gulping golden liquid from a salsa jar. Although Darwin Award editors feel that a jar of yellow liquid is best left sealed, uh, drinking its contents usually uh, does not lead to combustion. But the second mistake, lighting up a cigarette to recover from the shock of taking a mouthful of gasoline, was a decision that an average five-year-old would consider questionable. Gary's friend was a mechanic and kept the jar of gasoline by the kitchen sink to remove grease from his hands. All right, now, by age 43, I would have to presume that Gary knew gas-covered clothing and open flames are not a good combination. You know? I figure most of us learned that long before the age of 43. Per perhaps he thought enough time had transpired that his clothes had dried out enough that he could light a cigarette and... and, and uh, uh, but was instead met with an unexpected result. Either way, just like with the bomb collectors, Gary did not have the knowledge to know how to handle this deadly situation appropriately. I don't know. That might be arguable. Maybe he did know how to do it, and he, he, just, he just wasn't thinking. <clears throat> well, <laughs> or, or, he, or he did not use the knowledge that he had, and it cost him his life. All right. But these guys perish for lack of knowledge. All right? And we need to be very concerned about that in our walk because <clears throat> we need to be concerned about the second death. Amen? All right? <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and we have to think about whether we are using the knowledge that we have appropriately or if we need to gain more knowledge. All right? Hosea chapter 4. We're going to be on page 600 in the 1998 ISR. That's what I'll be reading from. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse 1. <clears throat> Hear the word of Yahweh, you children of Israel, for Yahweh has a case against the inhabitants of the land. For there is no truth or kindness or knowledge of Elohim in the land. Remember the name of the message is no Yahweh. Swearing and lying and murdering and stealing and committing adultery have increased. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns and everyone living there languishes with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea are taken away. However, let no one strive or reprove another, for your people are like those striving with a priest. 
and you shall stumble in the day, and the prophet shall also stumble with you in the night, and I shall make your mother perish. My people have perished for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being priests for me. Since you have forgotten the Torah of your Elohim, I also forget your children. Now, I'm going to be walking a bit uh, of a razor's edge here today because I'm going to share with you that not all learning is knowledge of the truth. Even, even learning about what you, you might learn about Scripture. The Scripture can be twisted by the unlearned and the unstable, and yes, also by wicked and deceived people. All right? And I can tell you this, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, like we just read. <clears throat> Hosea 4.1 says, Hear the word of Yahweh, you children of Israel. For Yahweh has a case against the inhabitants of the land, for there is no truth or kindness or knowledge of Elohim in the land. And then in verse 6 again it says, My people have perished for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being priests for me since you have forgotten the Torah. And what does Torah mean? Instruction. The instruction of your Elohim, I also forget your children. So it sort of looks like the truth and the knowledge of Elohim are in the Torah of Elohim, right? But there's another side to this coin that we want to look at here. And so let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be on page 1157 in the ISR. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days hard times shall come, for men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence, Wait a minute, you're telling me that the guys that are doing all this stuff here have a, a form of reverence? That's right. But denying its power. And turn from these. For among them are those who creep into the households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Did we not just read about that in Hosea? Yes, we did. They perished for lack of knowledge, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, learnable and teachable are not the same thing. There are some people, get on the internet, go to the library, pour all over all kinds of research, sources, and they will study and study and study on the thing that keeps their motor revved up. And they can learn. They can learn. Yahshua is a good case in point. You know, he could come in teaching the truth, and, and there were people who were not teachable. Right? They had a form of reverence, and they had learning. Learnable and teachable are not the same thing. Have you ever seen folks, may have been folks, who spent hours and hours studying and studying, always learning, and then tell you that their learning has, has led them to a higher understanding and that their eyes have been opened and, and suddenly they're standing against the instruction, the Torah, of Elohim in whole or in part, and now this thing or that thing is not required anymore when Yahweh clearly said, you do not take away, you do not add to His Word. That's a dangerous thing when your higher learning brings you to a, 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 a place uh, like was mentioned in Hosea, 
where we don't have, for, where we perish for lack of knowledge. All right? Let's put it another way. They're saying that their learning has taught them that we do not have to abide by the instructions of Yahweh. Now, let's uh, go back to 2, 2 Timothy 3, 6. For among them are those who creep into the households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There are men that can be led away too. We see it all the time, don't we? All right? Now, you've heard of women's intuition. I know you have. <laughs> it seems like Yahweh has, has sort of wired them that way. They sometimes get feelings in their spirit and, and uh, uh, about things that we men ought to pay attention to. That doesn't make it a fact but sometimes they perceive things that way, and we all listen. But, but I think that there are things on a spiritual level, too, where women can sometimes, because that's what Paul was particularly talking to here, uh, where they, they're sometimes more predisposed to being more easily deceived through feelings and the like. Okay? And, and a desire for enlightenment and to have their eyes opened does that sound familiar? And to have a closer contact with Elohim. All right? But let me let, give you a couple of examples here. Now, I've done this before in the congregation. Uh, uh, I don't think Toby's familiar with this and, and some new people that are out there in the, in, in, uh, the video land. But uh, uh, I'm going to mention a behavior, and you tell me which gender comes to mind. All right? Now, it ought to be pretty easy because there's only two. I don't care how many Facebook re recognizes. All right, there's only there's only two. All right, <clears throat> who comes to mind when I mention reading your horoscope daily? Female. <laughs> okay. How about going to the palm reader? Female. Okay. How about calling Sister Cleo to see what the tarot cards say? All right. Folks, folks at home, it was overwhelming. 100%, all of these came up as female. All right. There's a reason why you get such an overwhelming response to that, and that's because it's something that we have all seen. Okay, that's something that we have all seen. It's not prejudice. We have all experienced that. I mean, all right. And I think that there are times when ladies in particular need to be careful with, with what they do with the learning that they come up with because it, it may be that they are being drawn away by something or drawn away from something. Now, I'm not saying that it's always the case, and I'm not saying that men can't be drawn away too because they can. They certainly can. But, but we just took a poll based on our, our own experience and it was pretty consistent. All right. I think, I think there, there is something about that where women have to be especially mindful about that, that predisposition. Okay. But as we get back, cause remember what we're talking about today is learning and knowing Yahweh. All right. 2 Timothy 3, 6. For among them, there are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as Yochane and Mamre opposed Moshe, so do these also oppose the truth. Men of corrupt minds, bound worthless concerning the belief. But they shall not go further, for their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that of those men became. <clears throat> but you did closely follow my teaching, the way of life, the purpose, the belief, the patience, the love, the endurance, the persecutions, the suffering, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconian, and at Lustra. 
what persecutions I bore. Yet out of them all the Master delivered me, and indeed all those wishing to live reverently in Messiah Yahshua shall be persecuted. But evil men and impostors shall go on to the worst, leading astray and being led astray. But you stay in what you have learned and trusted, having known from whom you have learned, and that from a babe you have known the set-apart scriptures which are able to make you wise for deliverance through belief in Messiah, Yahshua. You, you do realize when Paul was writing this to Timothy, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had not been put together yet, right? Okay. All Scripture is breathed by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for setting straight, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work. Now, let's turn back, let's turn to uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians now. Chapter 2. And, uh, We're going, to, we're going to see that Paul recognizes that you can be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do you think maybe the Pharisees were caught up in some of that? That's important to remember. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way because the falling away is to come first and the man of lawlessness is to be revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worshipped so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim showing himself that he is Elohim. Do you not remember that I told you this while I was still with you? And now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in his time. For the secret of lawlessness, or mystery of iniquity, as it says in the KJV, is already at work, only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. And then the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of who? Satan. And all power and signs... And wonders of falsehood, you see that? Power and signs and wonders of falsehood. And with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth but have delighted in the unrighteousness. Now, why would Yahweh send these poor people a, 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 a strong delusion? That, it just doesn't seem fair, does it? Yahweh does not send them a strong delusion first. It says first, because they did not receive the love of the truth, all right, in order for them to be saved. Not having the love of the truth is what got them. All right. Not desiring wisdom is what got them, and it's not a new concept. All right. But the first thing they did was to not have a love of the truth. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. We'll be on page 728. All right, we're going to start reading verse 20. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the broad places. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out at the openings of the gates. In the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, would you love simplicity? And shall scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate what? Knowledge. Turn at my reproof. See, I pour out my spirit on you. I make my words known to you, because I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no one inclined, and you spurned all my counsel, and would not yield to my reproof. 
Let me also laugh at your calamity. Mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, let them then call on me, but I answer not. Let them seek me, but not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh. They did not accept my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, let them eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own counsels. For the turning away of the simple slays them, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me dwells safely and is at ease from the dread of evil. That sounds similar to what we read in 2 Thessalonians. Amen. So this is not something new. Yahweh didn't just decide to send a working delusion. All right? Kind of ask for it. Proverbs 2, verse 1. My son, if you accept my words and treasure up my commands with you so that you make your ear attend to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, Lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you would understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of Elohim. Hallelujah. For Yahweh gives wisdom. Out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And he treasures up stability for the straight, a shield to those walking blamelessly, to watch over the paths of right ruling and the way of his kind ones he guards. Then you would understand righteousness and right ruling and straightness, every good path. For wisdom would enter your heart and knowledge be pleasant to your being. Discretion would guard you. Understanding would watch over you to deliver you from the evil way, from the man who speaks perversities. Those who leave the paths of straightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, they delight in the perversities of evil whose paths are crooked, and they are perverted in their ways to deliver you from the strange woman, from the foreigner who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and has forgotten the covenant of her Elohim. For her house has sunk down to death and her paths to the dead. None going into her does return, nor do they reach the paths of life. So walk in the way of goodness and guard the paths of righteousness, for the straight shall dwell in the earth and the perfect be left in it. But the wrong shall be cut off from the earth, and the treacherous ones plucked out of it. The, the book of Proverbs has got a lot to say about wisdom and understanding and delighting in righteousness, all right? And the path of life and the knowledge of Yahweh. All right? Proverbs 9, I'll read two verses here. Proverbs 9 starting in verse 10. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the set-apart one is understanding. For by me, your days become many, and years of life are added to you. Do you think that perhaps we've, we've lost a little bit of fear when we say things like, I have higher understanding than what it says right here? Right? And, and that we don't have to follow Yahweh's instructions in this thing or that thing. And see, this happens with some regularity. It's happened to people who've been in this room before. It's, it's something that happens in groups all over the place. No group is immune from that. But when it happens, we've lost our fear of Yahweh. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm a big fan of learning. I'm a big fan of learning. But we need to be on guard, especially these days. I've seen people who are so concerned with understanding prophecy, and they have all this learning. And they've read books and books and spent hours and hours searching the Scripture and working and working to find revelation about the end times, etc. You know, I used to be consumed with that. And if prophecy weren't important, Yahweh wouldn't have it in His book. But after all the exhaustive efforts spent in trying to gain enlightenment about the future, 
one should ask oneself whether all of this time spent on events, which will likely happen after you've been put into the ground, is drawing you closer and closer in your walk with your Creator. Or lots of other things, for instance, like, like a, a numerology, for instance. You always got numbers all throughout the Scriptures. There are some people who are so consumed with this number means this and that number means that and they're so busy looking at numbers. We knew a gentleman one time, he couldn't talk about anything but the temple. Remember? Everything, everything was about making the temple again or what the temple meant or what the different parts of the temple, you know, and... and We have to ask, does that draw us closer to our walk with our Creator? Because that's the most important thing, I mean. All right. Or could it be that Hasatan is using it to distract you from the path of life? Told you before, I've seen a couple of prophecy experts. How many people have ever known prophecy expert? Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen them want to fight each other. You know? They, I'm going to tell you something I can make a whole lot of money on. All right. Now, I shouldn't tell you because you might run out and make it before I do. I could make a whole lot of money if I could come up with a paleo Hebrew decoder ring. Um, I really could. You know what? I could I could get me some cereal and call it sugar frosted oats <laughs> and and put that as a prize inside, you know? <laughs> there are so many people out there who have become consumed with the meaning of the pictographs. And that's all they can focus on. This isn't something new. We've been knowing folks doing this for years. And it's not necessarily drawing them into the knowledge of the Torah of Elohim for a sweeter obedience. All right. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, please. I have a very, very high appreciation for the awesome understanding which can come from understanding the meaning of the pictographs and how they relate to the meaning of words. Sometimes it's, it's, it's really, really awesome. It blows my mind. But, but another thing that blows my mind is how easily Hashitan can, can use something that Yahweh meant for good and get people to think that they have received enlightenment and revelation from the Ruach HaKodesh. And the next thing you know, they're, they're, they're learning or regarding the knowledge of the Torah of Elohim just like in Hosea's day. All right? Like when I hear when I hear one of these paleo prophets say, God revealed this to me, or, or uh, God this or God that, I know that whatever they're learning has not taught them reverence for the name of Yahweh. Amen? All right? See, that's called the third commandment. Now, that's called the third command. I want to know just how many times do you see Yahweh referred to as God in the Hebrew? All right. The answer is zero. But there's an idol named God that you can see in the Paleo Hebrew. So, how does your digging beyond the clear instruction? brought you into a more respectful attitude towards Yahweh. All right? <clears throat> Listen, most likely you don't have anything on the rabbis. I'm, I'm not advocating for the rabbis. I'm simply telling you. They've been doing this stuff for hundreds of years. All right? And, and 
They're doing that while actually being fluent in Hebrew and knowing the idioms, which most of us do not. And did it make them more obedient? All right. And did it, uh, uh, did it make them more obedient or did it advance a man-made learning system? Yes. One which breaks the commands of Elohim and teaches to break the commands of Elohim. Yahshua even said nullified the commands of Elohim. All right. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> did you know what? That's oldest trick in the book stuff. All right. And I'm, I'm, I'm planning on, on redoing the oldest trick in the book, but if you, if you, if you haven't seen that yet, you can, you can look that up on our, on our videos to get a good understanding of what that means. But it goes back to the book here and the oldest trick that was ever done in this book. See, Hasatan deceived Hawa with a promise of spiritual enlightenment. You know, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like Elohim. That's what he told her. Knowing, there's that word again, knowing, good and evil. And, and that was all it took for, for uh, uh, her to move her focus from seeking what Yahweh wanted her to do and following his commands into seeking her own desire. And one of the things that you need to think about before you comfort yourself with the idea that you couldn't be deceived or I couldn't be deceived because of my relationship with Yahweh. Yahweh walked in the garden with Adam and Hawa. The perfect man and the perfect woman in perfect union with each other and with their Elohim before the fall. I can promise that their relationship with Yahweh was like one like most people can only hope for. One that we hope that we'll have in the kingdom to come. All right? If Satan can pull that trick on her, you better believe that he can use it on us. That which Yahweh speaks clearly in His Torah will not be con contradicted by some hidden meaning. That's confusion. And He is not an Elohim of confusion. So beware. Okay, i got another Darwin Award to share with you. This is a more recent one. March 2020. 17th. Michael 6 and 58 read of a buried treasure in a book authored by an eccentric and controversial art dealer named Forrest Finn. In The Thrill of the Chase, Finn claims that he himself buried $2 million worth of gold coins and artifacts, other artifacts, somewhere out in the Rocky Mountains and gives clues throughout the book hinting at its secret location in nine poetry verses. Temptation was great for Michael, although 350,000 others had gone looking for the buried box, no one is known to have found it. Worse, four men had died in the effort. Unlike the rest of them, however, Michael knew where the treasure was buried. Heard that word, didn't you? Michael knew where the treasure was buried. Based on his interpretation of the, quote, clues in the book. So he talked a 65-year-old acquaintance into joining him on a treasure hunt, and their quest for quick riches began. On February of 2020, they headed to Dinosaur National Monument on the Colorado-Utah border. Michael was so certain he knew where the treasure was that neither he nor his colleague prepared enough prepared for an overnight stay in the mountains. No doubt, assuming that they... If they started early enough, they would be home by sunset $2 million richer. <laughs> well, Michael was wrong. They found no treasure, and they lost their bearings. Cold, hungry, and disoriented, the future looked grim for Michael and his friend. Shivering and close to death, they were fortunately found just in time by a search and rescue team who brought them down the mountain. 
One would think that having survived such an experience, Michael would have learned better, but he did not. One month later, after having sufficiently recovered, he set out for a second try. Once more, he sweet-talked the 65-year-old colleague into joining him because uh, treasure, this time they would find it. The unfolding COVID-19 epidemic had prompted intermittent closures of the Dinosaur National Monument, and hikers were cautioned that difficult terrain should be avoided so first responders could remain safe in quarantine. But that didn't stop Michael. On Tuesday, March 17th, he left Denver with a few candy bars. He's prepared now. Okay, a few candy bars, two bottles of water, a copy of Finn's book, and the clothes on his back. Just outside the park, the two men rented snowmobiles and loaded them into the bed of their pickup truck. The bemused rental agent watched the unprepared treasure her hunters drive off towards the remote northwest boundary of the park, perhaps wondering how long the unlikely pair would last before they returned. After nightfall, the rental agent alerted local authorities. The search began. On the morning of Friday the 20th, they found Michael's truck. On Saturday morning, they found the abandoned snowmobiles and saw that Michael and his friend had unwisely continued on foot. Saturday afternoon, they located the two men about a mile from the snowmobiles, ironically, at nearly the exact spot of the previous rescue a month earlier. Michael was brought back down the mountain, but this time in a body bag. His friend barely survived and refuses to talk about this ordeal to this day. In June of 2020, the treasure was rumored to have been finally discovered, but this word came from the author, Forrest Finn himself. And he has not provided any further details as of the time, uh, at the time of this writing. Finn's veracity has been questioned by, among others, the FBI. <laughs> and, and several lawsuits have since been um, filed against him. Some speculate the treasure, if it exists at all, consists of artifacts illegally harvested by Finn. Whatever the truth is, people will no doubt continue looking for the fabled treasure. If so, they had best uh, better be better prepared or else find themselves in the same sorry predicament as Michael and the treasure trove buried. <laughs> Did you notice that Michael knew? Michael knew where the treasure was buried, all right? Though 350,000 people had gone before them and four people had lost their lives, Michael was convinced that he had discerned things which all who had gone before him had either overlooked or misinterpreted. And even after having to be rescued one month before, he was so confident in his interpretation of the clues that he leaned on his own understanding and went right back to the same place, and this time it cost him everything. All right? So for whatever Michael thought he knew, he did not have the knowledge necessary to preserve his life. <clears throat> not in the environment that he placed himself in, all right. And the 65-year-old, all I can say is, him not real mark. <laughs> him not. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. One final Darwin Award. This one came uh, from uh, the archives of a 30-year-old 30, 30 ER MD. In the late fall and early winter months, snow-covered mountains become infested with hunters. One ambitious pair climbed high up a mountain in search of their quarry. The trail crossed a small glacier that had crust, crusted over. The lead hunter had to stomp a foothold in the snow one step at a time in order to cross the glacier. Somewhere near the middle of the glacier, his next stomp hit not snow, but a rock. The lead hunter lost his footing and fell down the crusty glacier he zipped oh, uh, off the edge and out of sight. Unable to, help his unable to help, his companion watched him slide away. After a while, he shouted out, Are you okay? Yes, came the answer. 
reasoning that it was a quick way off the glacier, <laughs> the second hunter plopped down and accelerated down the ice, following his friend. There, just over the edge of the glacier, was his friend, holding on to the top of a tree that barely protruded from the snow. There were no other treetops nearby, nothing to grab. Nothing but a hundred foot drop onto the rocks below. As the second hunter shot past the first, he muttered his final epitaph, a single word which we may not utter lest our mothers soap our mouths. Okay. You see, the second gentleman thought, right? He, he thought that he was okay, but he did not have the knowledge of the truth and it cost him his life, right? Right? We too have to learn the knowledge of the truth. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start reading in verse 20. We're on page 924. Matthew 7 verse 20. Yeshua says, in the Sermon on the Mount. So then... By their fruits you shall, what? Know them. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter into the reign of the heavens, but he who is doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them shall be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. That's where I want to build my house, I mean. All right. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them shall be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And it came to be when Yahshua had ended saying these words that the people were astonished at his teachings for he was teaching them as one possessing authority and not as the scribes. Remember, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing and so can misguided knowledge. And our last passage today is we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 3. Mishle. Chapter 3, page 729. And we're going to start reading in verse 5, Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Know Him in all your ways and he makes your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It is healing to your navel and moistening to your bones. And we don't want to earn any second death Darwin awards, oh man. I don't want any first ones, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but we certainly don't want to win any second death Darwin awards. And, and we certainly don't want to lose our lives with Yahweh over acts of rebellion and following in ways that lead us away from his path to life. And so what do we need to do? We need to know Yahweh. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his complete contentment. Hey, hey, and he can make a way. Humble yourself and pray and guard his Torah.